Go ahead and bring up his picture real quick, Timothy. Uh, Bill really was a guy who kind of pioneered the whole umpiring, uh, umpiring process here. He developed all the signs, you know, the safe, the out sign, and he did that so that anybody in the stands, regardless of whether or not they could hear him, uh, would be able to see and uh, understand what the call was. And he was noted for having such a stern demeanor that just with a look of his eye, he could send contentious baseball managers back to the dugout. He was often known as the old arbiter. Now, there was one occasion where Bill was umpiring a game. It was late in the game, the ninth inning, and there was uh, a play that was made. A hit was made, and a guy on third base came running in towards home. The ball was thrown back to home. The catcher catched it. He, the runner slid, and there was this big collision. And in the stands, there were people shouting back and forth. The one was saying, you know, it's out. The other was saying, it's safe. It's out. It's safe. And Bill turned around, and he said, it's nothing until I give the call right? And so that was kind of what Bill was known for, that authority on the field. Now we live in a day of spiritual and moral confusion. And some claim, well, we need to live this way, or we need to live this way. Others claim, well, there is no right way of living, so a person must choose their own way. Philosophers, educators, psychologists, politicians, even ministry leaders and pastors speculate about how we should live. And what we need in our life is not more speculation, but an sure and authoritative word on what is right and what is wrong. And we have that in the written word of God. Last week, as we got into Psalm 17, we talked about the fact that God has not remained silent. He has spoken to us, and we need to hear and obey his words. And there were three points that we noted are here in Psalms 19. The first is that God speaks. The second is what his word is and what it does for us. And third, how we should respond. Now, these three points have actually morphed into three sermons. And so this is going to be a trilogy of sermons out of Psalms 19. And last week, we looked specifically at how God speaks. We noted that he speaks through creation, but more specifically, he speaks through his written word. And we noted that there are six parallel statements in verses 7 through 11 that describe what the word is and what it does. And we looked at the first one last week. We looked at the fact that the law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. And I share that key statement that I wanted us all to understand. The law of God has all that is needed to fix what is broken and out of place in our souls. And we examined from that these three things, that the word is sufficient, it is powerful, and it is transformative. Now today we are picking back up with the second description that the psalmist gives of God's word. And to do that, let's go ahead and come back to Psalms 19 here and once again read 7 through 12, verses 7 through 12. It says, the law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The rules of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired they are than gold, even much fine gold, sweeter also than honey and drippings of the honeycomb. Moreover, moreover, by them your servant is warned. In keeping them, there is great reward. Who can discern his errors? Declare to me, innocent from hidden faults. Let's pause real quick here and prepare our hearts and minds with a word of prayer. Lord, I want to thank you so much for your truth this morning. I want to thank you for the fact that you have spoken to us through your word that we might be wise, that we might be changed, that we might understand who you are and how we are to live before you. And God, as we study your word this morning, may our hearts and lives be open to how you would have to work through the Spirit in our lives today. May our minds and hearts be moldable and shaped according to what you say is right and what you say is true. Father, I just pray for myself as I share your word. Lord, May it not be my thoughts that come out this morning. May it not be my truths, but your truths, faithfully shared through this servant by your grace to the benefit of this church this morning. God, we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, last week we looked at the first half of verse 7. This week we're looking at the statement in the second half. And it says that the testimonies of the Lord are sure. 
uh, like last week, we're going to follow this pattern through much of these statements. We're going to examine three words, define their meaning, and then and zero in on the application. And the first word I would have you notice here is the word testimonies. So we're going to look at testimony, sure and simple here in this first statement. If you notice throughout the psalm, uh, you know, the psalmist refers to God's word, the Bible, by many different terms. He calls them the law, the testimonies, the precepts, the commandments, among other things. And what he's doing is he's helping us understand all the different facets and functions of God's word in our life. The law refers to God's teaching and, and instruction. Testimony here refers to what God or the Lord declares to be true. You know, when you talk about a testimony in a courtroom setting, it's a declaration of the facts, right? And so here, when he talks about the testimonies of God, he's talking about what God declares to be the facts. If you want to know what God thinks about something, all you need to do is look at the testimony that he's given. And that's right here in his written word for you. And it says that the word or the testimony of the Lord here is sure. That means it's trustworthy. That means it's dependable. In other words, it's completely accurate to the truth. It never misrepresents or distorts the facts. And then finally, what does the testimony of the Lord do? It makes wise the simple. So here's this idea. And, you know, we take all these concepts, put them together, and it's this. If you want to see, if you want to understand, if you want to respond to a situation rightly, all you need to do is look and see what God's Word has to say about it. We've all played this game before, right? I got this bag here, and I got a mystery item inside the bag. And, you know, somebody reaches in, and they try to determine what it is, and so, Jace, I'm, or, or, Zach, I'm going to have you give it a try. Don't look inside the bag. Reach in, see if you can figure out what it is. And we've all seen all sorts of different situations here, right, where people reach in and sometimes they're scared. And don't worry, there's nothing dangerous inside of it, or at least not too dangerous. You shouldn't get too, too injured. Um, you know, some people reach in and they get scared. Other people, they reach in and they're like, oh, I know exactly what this is, and they declare it. Uh, any ideas what it is? It's a it's screw. Go ahead and pull it out. It's actually a bag of screws. Now you might be like, Pastor, why a bag of screws? Because that's what was lying around the church at the time. I was thinking of this <laughs> illustration. I found it and I put it in a bag. Uh, you know? But, you know, and you've got some people when they walk away from that game, some games, they feel very embarrassed, right? Because they were scared about something that really wasn't to be scared about. Uh, it wasn't worth being scared about. Others feel embarrassed because they said, oh, this is what it is with such certainty, only to be, uh, uh, be shown that uh, it wasn't quite what they thought it was. And here's what I want you to understand. A right understanding brings a proper response. And where do we find the right perspective that will give us a right understanding and help us respond to the various circumstances of life? It's right here in the Word of God with the testimony that God has given to us about what is true. And understand, this is so different from what the world and what our culture right now tells us to be true. The world tells us to trust our feelings and our own understandings of what is going on around us or even inside of us. And, you know, we might argue with people, well, you can't really trust your feelings because your feelings are subjects to change. But that's not a problem in a society where truth is relative, right? Truth can change based on circumstance to circumstance and feeling to feeling. And what that results in and what we can see is just pure and utter moral anarchy and chaos. And many in our society would argue, well, that's a good thing. People need to be free to do whatever they think or feel is best in that moment. Yet the Bible shows us what it looks like when, every, when people do whatever is right in their own eyes. It's called the book of Judges. And we just finished reading that if you're following along in our Bible reading plan. And look at how that book ended. It ended with this horrific act of abuse that was so bad that it shook Israel down to its very moral core. See, because we are slaves to sin, according to Romans 6, moral freedom never leads us to blessing. It only leads to brokenness and tragedy. Now, that's an entirely different sermon for an entirely different day. I've sat and after reading the book of Judges said, oh, this would make a great sermon series. So it might come up here in the future. It might not. I can't, can't tell you. I haven't made up my mind yet. 
But here's the point I want you to understand. Often we will be told and often we will tell ourselves what I think and what I feel defines what is right and true. And friends, if we are ever to be made wise by the testimonies of God, we have to humbly admit this. If I'm ever going to see and understand myself and my world as it truly is, God, I need you to show me what it is that is right, what it is that is true, what it is that is real. And so here's an action step for you. Whenever something comes up in your life, one of the first things that you should stop and do before we come to any conclusion is look to God and say, what do you have to say about this? Well, what do you say to be right and true about this situation? We commonly refer to this as having a Christian world view. It is looking at our world through the lens of God's opinions and God's truths and God's testimony and letting what we think be shaped by that. And so the first thing this morning we see is that since God's perspective on this world is dependable, we must listen and trust in it if we are to see ourselves and see this world for what it truly is. Now the next thing that we see the psalmist say is that the precepts of the Lord are right. The precepts of the Lord are right. And so Timothy, he's doing my PowerPoint for me. Go ahead and click a couple slides forward. One more. One more, one more, all right, there we are. And so it's his first time doing it, and so I'm doing a little teaching for my, my media guy along the, along the same lines here. It says, the precepts of the Lord, Lord are right. Now once again, the three words I want to focus on in this phrase are precepts, right, and joy. Now precepts here means rules, regulations, and guidelines for living. Now, God's word, understand this, is not simply there to tell you what to think. It guides us in real and practical ways. The Bible is more than just a bunch of stuffy religious ideas or intellectual positions. The truth God gives us is to have an honest and active impact on the way we think, on the way we feel, and on the way we behave. You know, when you need to get somewhere, what do you normally reference? A map, right? Now, Back when I first started driving, we didn't have GPSs, we had these things. And once you open them up, it's impossible to ever fold them back in the way they opened up. You know, especially if you move them around and stuff like that. And, you know, if you needed to get to a place in Ohio, you'd first figure out where you were at, and then you'd trace all the road lines back to where you needed to go. Of course, now we have modern technology where all you have to do is type in an address. Hey, look, I got it back all the way. That's one in a million when that happens. Uh, you just type in your address and, you know, using technology, it figures out where you're at and maps you several different courses to where you need to go. And uh, a couple weeks ago, I was actually, no, it was either this past week or two weeks ago, I was sitting in the office in uh, a Google car, because, you know, they drive these Google cars, did a loop in our turnaround there. And so apparently our loop in our parking lot is now on Google Maps. And if they're doing the street view, they probably have a picture of my office window and me sticking my head out and going, huh, what's going on there? You know, Who's that? But, you know... And we reference a map to figure out where we're at and where we need to go. And in the same way, God's Word is to be seen as a road map for our life. It shows us at where, where we're at. It shows us where we need to go. And it helps us see how we need to get there. Friends, do you want to know how to live a purposeful and meaningful life? Do you want to be a good spouse? Do you want to be a good friend to others? Do you want to know how to respond well to difficult people? Do you want to overcome the struggles that plague your heart and mind? Well, you don't have to figure out how to do that on your own. God has provided you direction for your life. He's provided His Word to help you see where you're at and where you need to go and the steps you need to take in order to get there. You know, the next statement that we have here is that the Word of God is right. It is straightforward and just. Have you ever taken a wrong turn at some point? Uh, you know, maybe taking the long way around. You know, when we don't want to say we got lost, we said, well, we took the scenic route. We took the long way, right? 
Now, it's happened to me before, and it's normally when I'm not using a GPS. I know the route, and so I'm sitting there, and I'm just talking with Stephanie, enjoying our time together, because sometimes that's the only moment we have in life, to sit next to each other and just talk as when we're driving to places. And, you know, we're talking away, and then I, go, then I all of a sudden look up and go, oh, there went my turn, right there, right? And sometimes we can get so lost, we can get so misplaced that we actually have to stop, look at the map to figure out where we're at before we can figure out where we need to go. And in the same way, Scripture is there to show us that right way of living where at times we have gone at course and how we need to get back on track. 2 Timothy uh, 3.16 says this, All Scripture is profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness. In other words, it shows us what is right, it shows us what is wrong, it shows us how to get right, and it shows us how to stay right. And you know, a lot of times, people are not in the same place in the map of life, if you will. You know, you have some people who are on that right road, and what God's Word says is, okay, here's the next step you need to take in your obedience and your growth in Jesus Christ. Other people, they're just a little bit off track. And God's Word says, okay, here's the change that you need to bring to bring your life into greater conformity. Some people, they've driven off the road and they're in a swamp, stuck in a ditch someplace, and God's Word says, okay, you maybe feel like it's hopeless, that you're stuck, there's no way out of this, but here's the strength, here's the promise that God has given to you of healing and getting you back where you need to go. And so let's talk about some action steps here. You know, how do we take this wonderful truth we've been presented about God's Word and bring it to bear in our life? Well, first of all, let me challenge you this way. How do you know that you're being a good spouse? How do you know that you're being a good dad? How do you know that you're being a good church member? You know, let me challenge you. If the next words out of your mouth is, well, this is what I think, you're using the wrong map this morning. What is to be guiding the steps of our life is not our personal opinion. It is the authority of God's Word. What he says is right, what he says is true, the directions that he gives to us. And so, if we want to say, well, how do I do these things? God's word has provided that direction for our life. It's not just stuffy theological intellectual positions. These glorious truths have a real life-defining impact on how we live in every aspect of our life. I think of the following part of uh, 2 Corinthians 3, 16 and then 17. We read it last week. That we might be thoroughly equipped for every good work. All of these things are there to equip us for everything we need to live in every aspect of life for the glory of God. Now, you may know, likewise, something is wrong in your life. But how are you going to identify what's wrong? How are you going to know what changes need to be made? Once again, this is where God's Word provides guidance. You know, this is the incredible thing. As it says in Hebrews, you know, the Word of God is powerful. It discerns the hearts and intentions. It helps me understand what is broken in my life in ways that I could never see in and of myself. It helps me see the changes deep that need to happen by God's grace through His power in my soul and leads me to the truths that I need to believe that will produce those changes in my heart as I embrace them. And so friends, the roadmap for life, the thing to help us understand where we're at, where we need to go, what needs to be fixed, all the answers God has provided to us in His Word if we are but willing to come and humbly seek them out. Now the final thing that we see is that it causes joy. Joy here is inner peace and tranquility. You know, most people want to be happy. I don't honestly know of anyone who would say, I don't want to be uh, happy or fulfilled. You know, there might be some people who say, well, I don't want to be happy. I said, well, would would being unhappy make you happy? Yes, well, then you want to be happy. Just not in the same way that everyone else wants to be happy, right? But the two big questions is this, what are happiness and what is happiness and, and how do I get it? And God's Word defines for us what true happiness is and guides us towards it. The Word explains that the fullness of joy is in God, and through His Word, He guides us to Himself and helps move us closer to Himself and through them refines our lives to look more like Him. Think of Psalms 16.11. It says, Make known to me the path of life. Go ahead and pull that Scripture up for me. Make known to me the path of life. In your presence, there is the fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. 
Where is happiness? Where is fullness found in our life? It is with God, right? Now consider John 15, 10. This next passage here. If you keep my commandments... You will abide in my love, just as I've kept my Father's commandments and abide in His love. These things I have spoken to you, that you may be, uh, that joy may be in you, and that your joy may be full. Friends, let me ask you: Is your heart full of bitterness? Is it full of sorrow? Is it full of frustration? Is it full of discouragement? Is it full of discontentment? God, through His Word wants to do a work in your heart where He takes these things and replaces them with joy. With a full and abiding joy. You know, maybe this morning you've created your own definition of joy. Maybe you've said, you know what, joy is having X number of possessions or X amount of money in my life. Joy is having this measure of power. Joy is having this certain person or relationship in my life. The Word of God is there to show us what true joy is and where it really comes from. Through the Word of God, God wants to redefine, if you will, our definition of joy so we can see what it really is, where it's really found, and how we can lay hold of it. So the Word of God guides our life in real and practical ways towards Himself conforming our lives into His image. And as He does these things, we find joy within our hearts. Joy in our lives that abides. And so the next thing that we see here is that the Word of God is right. Filling us with joy. Guiding our lives. Guiding us towards Him. The next thing that we see is that the commandments of the Lord is pure. Pure here means faultless or without error. And it's a little bit more than the fact that God's Word is without error. Its purity shows us what is true. You could almost translate it this way. The Word of the Lord shows us what is accurate. If I could illustrate it this way, I guess this Sunday is Object Lesson Sunday because I have all sorts of object lessons. How long is this board? Take some guesses. Somebody... 21 inches. All right, anyone else? Now remember your guesses because I will not. I'm just warning you right now. 21 inches. Anyone have any other guesses? 32 inches. Two feet was one. 34. All right, and so let me actual, well, let me explain some things real quick. Uh, you know, what are these at the end of the day? They're just guesses, right? Uh, you're just making an assumption here that, okay, this is the measurement here. The only way that we're going to know is if we actually compare it with a standardized form of measurement, right? And it's interesting, there's actually three classes of tape measures out there. This is my woodworking hobby coming out for you this morning. Uh, class one being the best and class three being, you know, the worst. Most tape measures that you get from hardware stores are class two. But a class one tape measure over a 32 foot distance will only have about a 32nd of an inch variance. That's uh, three one hundredths of a variance in, uh, of an inch in the overall measurement. That is incredibly accurate, right? Now, how long is this one? Uh, it is two feet and an eighth of an inch. This one only goes down to sixteenths. And so, uh, who, had the, who was closest? Who said two feet? Who was the worst? Uh, who, who, somebody guessed you guessed 32, and so, all right, you can have this at the end of the day. You need this more than I do, apparently. <laughs> and so, and, yep, eyeball, don't eyeball it, Elisa. It is not a good idea there. And so I've done the same thing, so there's no shame there. I've looked at a measurement and been way off before. But that's a problem, right? If we try to measure the accuracy or the rightness of things by our own eyes, it's often misplaced. It's often not what is true. And with God's Word... It is first and foremost completely accurate. It is exactly on point every time. And so what we can do is see ourselves and our world exactly as it is. You know, the first point really was about understanding. The second point really was about direction. This one really is about discernment. 
determining the difference between right and wrong. Have you ever asked, you know, I wish I had something that would help me make sense of this messy world, to really identify what's going on here, what's gone wrong. You know, I wish I had something to help me filter out good advice from bad advice when it comes into my life. I wish I had something to tell me what is definitively right or wrong in this situation. And so friends, we have that right here in God's Word. It is pure. And in its purity, it gives us an accurate, perfect measurement by which to compare everything else to in terms of what is true and not true, what is right and not right. And so once again, here's an action step for you. Whenever you hear a statement, before you affirm it or deny it, here's what you need to do. You need to snap a measurement. You need to bring it to God's Word and say, okay, does it measure up? Uh, Does it fit with what God says is right and true? Seth and I were studying this week. We've been digging into some theology together, and I shared with him a quote that I really like. Discernment is the difference between knowing what is right and what is almost right. And friends, do you know where that comes from? It comes from the faithful study of God's Word. The more we study God's Word, the better we understand what God's Word says is right and true and perfect in His eyes the better we're going to be at snapping that measurement and going, this measures up or this doesn't. So here's the application point for you this morning. Before you embrace something as true and right and proper, take a measurement. And God has given you the ruler, the tape measure, if you will. It's right here in your hands in His written Word. Now I want to connect these last two ideas together real quick here. It says, the fear of the Lord is clean, and it will endure forever. Now, let's look at that word fear there. Go ahead and advance the slide one there, Timothy. Now, you look at this, and you might wonder, okay, did the writer forget what he was talking about? Did he have an ADD moment where he lost his focus? Because, you know, he's been talking about the Word of God, the precepts of God, you know, and now he switches over to the fear of God. And he didn't lose his thought or his focus at all. Now, first of all, fear is not the idea of being afraid of God, but in awe of Him. It is giving Him the respect He deserves. And in relation to the context that he's talking about, he's making clear that the Bible is not simply something that gives us information. It is there to draw us to a person, our God, our Creator, and elicit out of us a response of worship and respect, and reverence. The Word is there to deepen our knowledge of God, uh, our love of God, our obedience to God, and our amazement with God. And if you walk away from the world and you are not more more deeply in love of Him, deeply in awe of Him, and not moved to deeper worship of Him, you have done something wrong. And I think there is a big danger where we can approach the Word of God with a very intellectual attitude. We look at God's truth and we look at the Bible as something that is to be memorized, understood, and recited. And we run the risk therein of reducing it to something that's highly impersonal. You know, uh, I've often struggled with this danger as I have spent most of my life in what's called a, a, a Christian academic environment where a lot of the people I surround myself with, we do deep study of God's Word. We use big, fancy, you know, theological terms. And sometimes I walk away from those moments and those studies and have asked myself, what good is all this knowledge? How is this going to actually move me? And it is there, but I have a responsibility, not just to understand and define, but to let that understanding and definition shape how I actually live and relate with my God and my Creator and my Savior. I kind of think of it like the order of operations in mathematics, um, PEMDAS. Some of you students right now are working through order of operations so you can solve your algebraic equations properly, right? Parentheses, exponents, multiplication, division from left to right, addition, uh, division and sub- multiplication left to right, and addition and subtraction left to right. For some of you who didn't do well in algebra, that's just causing you, so, you some PTSD, right? Ooh, no, I, I don't want to do that again. But all that really is is just merely factual, rational tools to help you solve problems, right? It it doesn't move you into a deeper relationship with somebody, does it? And we should never boil the Bible down to just factional, 
rational information that's there to solve problems in our life. It is far more than that. And you know, there are some out there who have a great deal of respect for the Bible, who, who often reference the Bible, but still, at the end of the day, simply treat it as a book that has a set of sound, rational, intellectual arguments. Oh friends, it is far more than that. We should not simply look at this book as a textbook for truth, but we should look at, more, at it more in the terms of a, of a love letter. See, in it, God expresses who He is, what He has done for us, and how we are to respond to Him. Now, somebody might ask, well, is the Bible about facts or is the Bible about a relationship? And the answer is both. It's both. The Bible tells us the facts of our God and the relationship we're to have with Him. It shows us the beauty and the glory and the greatness of who He is and what He has done for us. And as we see those things, that beauty should captivate our hearts and say, this is someone I want to know. This is someone I want to have a relationship. Someone who rightly deserves all of my worship. See, ultimately through those truths, He moves us closer to Himself, ultimately restoring us to Himself and transforming us and all things to be like Him. And it is in Him and the proper worship of Him that the struggles of our soul find their solution. And so friends, let me break this down and once again give us some real practical action steps for our lives. Whenever we read the Bible, we must stop and ask ourselves this question at the end of every study, no matter how deep and academic it may be. How does this cause me to know God better, love Him better, and worship Him in ways that I never have before? At the end of every study, we have to take what we're learning and draw it back into the relationship that we are called to have. And the called to... Uh, that. Scripture points us to and and leads us to. Uh, I think another good action step is whenever we get done studying Scripture, we should immediately stop and talk to God about what we have learned. Uh, Because that immediately takes the truth that we've studied and it it brings it straight into the context of our relationship with Him as we communicate to Him about it. You know, and so as I sit and study you know, things about God's glory and God's greatness, what do I do? I stop afterwards and I praise Him and say, Oh God, thank You for who You are. Thank You for the greatness of, uh, of uh, Your power, uh, of Your wisdom. And Father, you know, sometimes it leads me to a place of confession, right? As I learn these things, as I study these things, Father, forgive me for not treating You as the great person that You are. Forgive me for treating other things as more great than You. So as we deal with all of these truths, they're never to be separated from the relationship and the God that they are leading us to worship, to know, and to praise with every part of our life. And I think that's a very dangerous thing for us to do. I think it's a very easy thing for us to do. You know, I grew up in a church. You know, this is one of the things that I do appreciate about the Baptist background that I've had, uh, the fundamental Baptist background that I've had. You know, most of the churches I've grown up in are highly you know, dedicated to biblical education, to helping you develop a sound and right understanding of God's Word. And so as a result, from a very young age, I was very e- easily and a- very able to you know, express what I believed and what I, uh, I thought the Word said rightly is true. But something I began asking myself and asking others is, well, how does this shape my life? How does this actually cause me to relate to God differently? And often... For myself and others, there'd be a lot of deer in the headlights moments. Because I understood the word well, but I didn't understand how to find the relationship that I had with that God very well. And so friends, understand that these things that are written here are not just to increase the understanding of our mind, they're in to increase the depth of our love for God. And the depth of our relationship with Him. And the depth of our worship of Him. Now it says here as we proceed on, that they are clean, that they are true, that they are altogether righteous. Clean means being free from corruption. True means being faithful or always right. Altogether righteous is a consummative term that makes clear that all of God's Word, every bit of it, is true. It endures forever. Now, cleanliness and rightness, uh, and so in other words, God's Word is right, it is true, and it never changes. 
Now, I cannot stress strongly enough the importance of these last statements here. Theologically, this is referred to as the inerrancy of God's Word. And I would argue in our relativistic society, if I can get that word out right, which means that we truly don't believe that there is one absolute truth. That's what relativistic means. You know, truth changes. This is one of the biblical truths, one of the doctrines of the Bible that have come under most criticism and attack. And what I want to do is, I think I want to pause here and come back to this next week. Now, I'll admit, this morning this sermon went way faster than I expected it to. And so I'm sitting here going, wow, I have 15 minutes left and I don't have any content for the next 15 minutes. But listen, I have never heard a church member complain about a pastor getting done with a sermon early. And so um, I could sit here and I could work my way through the importance of the inerrancy of God, but this is such a, uh, a controversial doctrine in our society today and such an important one for us to understand that I really do want to come back to it. I really want to think through it well and then talk about it with you in detail. Because let me encourage you, the relativistic nature of our society hasn't stayed out in our society. It has bled into our church. And there are statistics out there that Christians people who profess to be followers of Jesus Christ, are asked, do you believe that the Word of God is 100% true? And the statistics that come back is there is a large percentage that say no. We're not sure. And friends, if the Word of God is not 100% true, how can we trust it? Where are the right things? Where are the wrong things? What are the true things? What are the not true things? Once again, they come down to our own subjective experiences, right? What do we believe to be true and what not? And so these are the things we're going to come back to. A little bit of a cliffhanger there. But we're also going to spend some time talking about, in light of these truths, how do we need to approach God's Word? How do we need to treasure God's Word, pursue God's Word, and let it shape our lives? Now as we wrap up here, you know, it's something that you may do from time to time when you're shopping in the grocery store is you look at you know, the ingredients there the nutrients uh, included in uh, that item that you're about ready to eat. Now, some of you might not do that at all. You're like, it looks good, I think it tastes good, so I just take it and don't read the nutrition facts. You know, you rather live in ignorance there. But if you're trying to organize your diet in a very specific way, you may look and see how many carbs does that actually have? How much sugar does it have? How much fat does it have? And how is that going to impact me? You know, something that I often look at as a skinny guy is how much protein does it have, you know? Working out, things like that, I'm like, I need protein. If not, I'm not going to build muscle and, you know, I'm just going to continue to be that real thin little guy. And uh, as you can tell, it's worked really well over the, you know, (laughs) not much change has happened. But here's what's so important, and here's the point of the illustration. It's important for us to understand the nutrients that are here. Because when we do, we see the necessity of it in our life. These have things, God has provided us in His written Word, things that we can't live without. Things that we can't function without. He's provided within it the things we need to experience restoration in our soul. In this written Word has the message of a Savior who can make all things new. And as we talked about last week, therefore these things need to be heard, they need to be understood, they need to be believed, and it is only in faith that we'll experience that reviving work. In these things, we find the ability to understand, see ourselves and our world for for what it truly is. We don't have to guess. We don't have to assume. We have this perfect Word that gives us understanding, that helps us discern right from wrong. And man, there's a lot of conversation out there about right and wrong in our society today. A lot of opinions. How will you know which one to embrace? How will you know which one to reject? Right here. And then, this Word shapes our life. And it shapes our life in this way. It brings us closer to a person. It lets every action, every thought, every feeling be shaped by the glory and the love that we have for God. Friends, let me ask you, how have you approached this? Uh, How do you treat this? Is it with the preciousness that it should be? I think a lot of times we look at the Word of God as something, you know, normal in our life. 
Uh, we can take it for granted. Uh, we can look at it as something insignificant. You know, like we talked about last week, if you got a letter from the president, you'd be excited about that, right? Uh, and there, that comes with a weight, that comes with an authority, that comes with an importance. Friends, the God of the universe has spoken into your life. And He has spoken to you a word. Now, I know some of you, based on your liking of that, I see your looks right now. Based on the current president that we have, you may be excited or not excited to get a letter from him. Okay. Now, if it was the president you fully liked and loved, you'd be very excited. Okay. Some of you are looking at me going, no, I would not be excited to get a letter. <laughs> I saw the looks and I had to address them. But for the most part, we would be very excited about that. But friends, here we have a letter from the God of our, uh, the God of our universe the Creator who has spoken His truth into our life that we might see, understand, and through it, grow to worship and love Him more. So maybe this morning, you need to bring, let this bring some transformation into your life. Maybe your opinion of right and wrong has been solely based on what you think, what your opinion is, and you need to let that become founded in God's Word. Maybe you have questions this morning, struggles, and you don't know how to deal with them. Maybe you need to do something you haven't done before, and that's come here to the Word of God and see the direction, the understanding, and the hope and healing that He offers. Maybe you, like me, sometimes have taken the Word of God and devolved it into nothing but theological positions and intellectual arguments. Maybe you need to stop after every study and ask that question. How does this move me and cause me to fall deeper in love with my God and my Savior? Let's end in prayer. Father, I just once again thank you so much for the gift and the grace of your word. Lord, you've, ex you've described what it is to us so beautifully and so clearly here in this psalm. Something that transforms our soul. Your power is at work through it. Something that gives understanding to our mind that we might see the world ourselves for as it truly is. Something that gives us direction to our life. And not just meaningless direction, not just religious routine, but direction that leads us deeper into a relationship, a right relationship with You. Oh Father, may we look at Your Word and treasure it appropriately. May we embrace it and apply it to our life faithfully. May we study it diligently that we may benefit from what You have given to us. And that our hearts may be moved to deeper worship and love of You. Father, I pray as we've heard Your Word and the challenges that we've received from the truth of it, that we wouldn't walk away unchanged. Maybe there is somebody here today, and this is a moment as we end in prayer and song where they need to come to You and make a commitment, engage in repentance, and approach You and Your Word in ways they never have before. Father, maybe they've just kind of looked at it as supplemental, something they can reference when they're out ideas. Father, may they treat it with the authority that you have called it to have in our lives. Maybe it's been something that they know, but really hasn't transformed them, really hasn't moved them closer to you. Father, maybe we need to repent of that intellectualism and let that faithful study lead us to deeper love in ways we never have before. Father, we love You and we thank You for this grace. We thank You that through Your Son and the redemption that we have in Him, we can be transformed. Through the Spirit who is within us, who gives us understanding and conviction that comes through what You've spoken to us in Your Word. Father, we love You and pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Uh, short, not long after... Uh...